Lord, thank you that you chose us in our mother's womb. You chose us before the beginning of time. And we take that to the nth degree. That means that one level, you knew that we were going to be here this morning. So that meant you want to talk to us, Father. So Lord, give us listening ears to hear, to take on board what you're saying to us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So, the voice. The voice? The, the program, the voice? Are you not with me? The singing thing where the four judges or whatever have got their chairs, they've got their backs to you. And don't watch it, no. Nor do I actually watch it, but I do understand the concept behind it. And, and YouTube is very useful when you want to figure out roughly what happens. So, the voice. Apparently, the idea of the voice is that you go on and you sing to the backs of chairs of four judges. Really encouraging, yeah? And uh, when you watch it, what happens is, and of course, if a judge thinks your voice sounds amazing, they, they hit a button and, and, and the chair swivels round and it highlights, I want you. So saying, I want you to be on my team, apparently. Yeah, with me so far? And, um, and when you watch some of these, uh, these clips of what they do, don't panic, I don't spend my entire life watching these YouTube clips. But unfortunately, there's some that aren't chosen. But there's a last chunk that seemed to be, when you do the compilation type, everybody's chosen, and you can have one judge or all four judges want you. Now, what I like about it is two things. First and foremost, the entire thing is based upon your voice and your talent, not your looks. And, and what gets me is that sometimes, I don't know if you notice, but what happens is sometimes, literally, the person just sings the first note and the judge has literally hit the button. And you're like, what is it they've heard that the rest of us haven't? And it's like that person's got a particular talent or something that has set them apart at that moment within the first note. Now, I don't know about you, but a couple of the ones I've watched, I've got quite emotional. I've actually got quite emotional about it because I've gone, wow. And then when you watch that person at the end and they've realized they've been chosen, I mean, they've seen it happen, but they've carried on with the performance, finished to the end. They are literally falling down, collapsing in tears that they have been chosen. And there's been the odd one or two that I've noticed. So what happens is the minute they get hit with that first button, they go, because <gasps> they can't believe it. And apparently they got their family and friends out the back watching it. And of course, the family and friends are really relaxed and like, yeah, whatever. If they get chosen, they do. If they don't, they don't. No, not the family are like, come on, hit the button. And then sometimes when they hit the button on that first note, they're like, oh, they go all a bit crazy for some reason. I don't know why. I don't know what the problem is really. And, and they go nuts, and it's just like they go, and sometimes you get the presenter say, see, what did you need to worry about? So what set these singers apart? What makes them that immediately unique? Clearly a particular style in their voice. Maybe it's the song they chose really, really met with their style of voice. Maybe they got something gravelly in it that just made them sound really, really amazing. Whatever it is, it set them apart. So what makes you different? What sets you apart? I mean, Visually, we all look different, don't we? Look at each other. You, you can look at each other. It means turning the head. It's amazing what happens when you do that. You get a different perspective if you turn your head. It's quite strange. You all look different, don't you? Some of you might be wearing different clothing. 
Ever got seen a couple walk out and they got exactly matching clothing? Oh well. So one time Joy and I walked out recently and we went, oh my life, we look like we're in the green army or something. We were literally wearing the <laughs> same colour coordination. But your fingerprints are all different, aren't they? Nobody's got the same fingerprint. But is that enough that sets you apart? If that's enough that sets you apart. Let's look at somebody talking to God uh, about what sets them apart. It's in Exodus chapter 33. You can turn to it if you wish. We're not going to spend very long in it. Uh, but it's, um, it's Moses. Do we all know Moses? Yeah, Ten Commandments man. Yeah, okay. So uh, Moses, now this is where he's still leading the Israelites out from captivity and they've sort of half constructed a, a tabernacle and a tent, and he's spending time with the Lord. Now, it's interesting, when you look at this, just prior to this chapter, the Israelites have been immensely rebellious, made a golden calf, gone and worshipped other gods. They've really upset the Lord. Okay? By the way, you all now look really, really different, because I've taken my glasses off and I can barely see you. It's going well. And so they've really upset the Lord. And so the Lord is now needing to spend time with them. So you'll see in a moment that actually what he does is he goes and takes a tent that's set outside of the camp. So you've got to imagine this. So everybody's camping together in wherever in the wilderness, in the deserts, yes? And the Israelites have upset God, and, but they are repentant of this and they want to return back to God. But the Lord has sort of been a little bit like, as a good, you know, parent would do, sort of saying, you know, you just need to know that what you did was bow out of order. And so Moses has to go and set a tent up outside of the camp, partly to be, I suppose, to take him away from the, the sort of the, the, the worldly issues that's going on within the camp, but so he can go and spend time with the Lord. I suppose for me, a bit of a modern thing is us taking time out and, and going and saying, I'm going to spend time with the Lord, yeah? Who, you know, taking time. You might remove yourself from your normal room, especially the one with the TV if you can, and go somewhere else. You might only live in one room and you need to go out completely and, and spend time. But we go out to spend time with the Lord, yes? To go and focus on him. Okay. So, but I, I read this and I, I was quite surprised at what, for the first time I've seen that Moses said this. So... So it was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would stand up and stand in the entrances of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. He went into the tent. The pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. So we all know about the cloud of pillar that led them out and led them across the desert. And this is sort of God's glory. So as Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would come down. When the people saw that the cloud saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. I think seeing the glory of the Lord, you would, wouldn't you? Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as one speaks to a friend. I just want to focus on that just for a moment. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face. Just, just capture that in your imagination at the moment. Not literally face to face, but the, the imagery is the sense of meeting with the Lord so intimately, so clearly face to face. Just, just capture that image. Do 
Now, being honest, and this is a real question, what's your thoughts and feelings if that was you? You've gone specifically out to meet with the Lord, to go and have a chat with him. And you're meeting with him like Moses, face to face. What's your thoughts and feelings? What a privilege. Thank you, Timmy. Awesome. a pillow to hide my face <laughs> you'd look for a pillow to hide your face honest i think that's probably about 90 percent of the people in here is probably thinking that you've just been more honest than others thank you anybody else i'll prostrate and cover my face completely all of me prostrate and cover your face completely all of you anybody else So then let's take the rest of that verse that he meets with the Lord face to face, just like a friend. Now, Hannah, do you cover your face with a pillow when you meet with a friend? You don't? No. That's good. But we don't, do you? You wouldn't cover your face. Some of us might slap on makeup. Do not see me before my face is on. I remember years ago, a um, family member once saying that. No, 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 don't come around until my face is on. Okay, I've known you since we were in nappies. Okay. <laughs> it's true. But when you're meeting with a friend, you meet with them face to face, don't you? And they see all your blotches, all your spots. The yellow head you burst earlier on that morning that's still red. Oh, just get over it. It's real life. Okay? And you've got all of that. And so Moses met with God face to face as a friend, with all of Moses's imperfections. It's quite something, isn't it? Say that image just for a minute. And he met with him face to face as a friend. And so they chatted. Do you talk to your friends well? Good. Are we all hot? So you're more responsive to that question than the other one. And so then they had a conversation, and they would meet as friends. I can't, you know, that actually would meet in this tent, chatting. Wow. Just, just, be, got to bear in mind, this is before Jesus, okay? So this is like the holy God. Remember, by the way, that nobody else could come to the mountain when Moses was up there. You couldn't touch it, or else it's death. Yeah. So this is Moses has this unique, at this point, this unique relationship. So these are one of the conversations that we're going to listen into now. One day, Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, take these people up to the promised land. But you haven't told me whom you'll send with me. You have told me, I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. So clearly Moses maybe is at a frustration point with the Lord. You've been promising me we're going to go to the promised land and you're going to be sending somebody with me. And hello, you still not actually told me who that is, even though I've been meeting with you face to face all this time. Would you like to tell me? Now, that's quite an honest conversation. You think about that. It's quite an honest conversation. Quite a, I, I think Moses was quite blunt. I think he was being real with God. He wasn't like, I'm in the holy presence of the Lord and I must change my language now and use thou's, these and that's. Because if I say anything else that sounds like normally me, it's not going to be holy enough. But he was quite blunt. You have said you will use me to take us people into the promised land. And you told me that you'll send somebody with me. 
that reminded me, that probably takes Moses back to when he first was being commissioned to take the Israelites out. He spent the entire time saying to God, please send somebody else. Anyway, later on it's Joshua, but we'll come to that later. We're not going to talk about that today. But you said you're going to do this and you haven't done it. And if you supposedly look favorably upon me, if you supposedly approve of me, what's this, when's this going to happen then? Because I'm at a point of frustration now. Ever had that honest conversation with the Lord? Notice how Moses had it. Moses didn't appear to worry afterwards. Oh, what's God's going to punish me now for that conversation? He had an honest conversation. He met with him face to face as a friend and was real with him as a friend. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Now, if that was the response from the Lord, what would be your reaction at this point? Thank you. Done and dusted, yeah? So the Lord's just promised, I will personally go with you. I'm going to give you rest. Everything's going to be fine. Don't stress, yeah? So Moses clearly went, thank you, Lord, and walked off. No, he didn't. He said, then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. He's double checking, isn't he? Just to clarify, you may be the all-powerful, all-knowing Lord, but I just want you to clarify, if you don't go with us, this is what it means. Just in case you didn't know. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? Now, this is just, this is the bit that makes us the voice. This makes the uniqueness that's coming now, okay? Notice Moses is both speaking for himself as the leader of the people, and the people. He's actually saying, if you don't go with me and don't go with your people, how's anybody going to know? So it's interesting, he's, wor he's concerned quite rightly about himself. And this is the uniqueness. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Your presence among us and with me sets us apart from all the other people on earth. Notice that Moses didn't turn around to God and say, if I go in a chair four and a half thousand years from now and I sing in front of four judges with their back to them and my gravelly voice comes across really well and they bang their button on the first buzzer, that's what sets me apart. It is God's presence with us that sets us apart. Not the fashionable clothing we're wearing. It's God's presence with us that sets us apart. I, I, I want us to really capture the meaning of what that means. Yes, you all look different. Yes, we all have got different degrees of how we look. And, and if I don't have the latest fashionable trainers or what's those new things, those slip-on shoes with the furry sliders? I mean, okay, I'm clearly getting old-fashioned. But those are not the things that set you apart. It's God's presence. It's, it's his presence in you and with you. 
That's what sets you apart. I believe today that God is saying you need to capture some truths. You need to capture that you're a child of the living God. He chose you in your mother's womb. He chose you before the beginning of time. And it's his presence in you that sets you apart. It's his presence that sets you apart. Nothing else sets you apart. Why? Not just for today, but for now and forever, right until the very end of time. That's what sets you apart. And I believe the Lord really wants us to capture that so that when we realize how set apart we are, how, how loved we are, how much we are his child, nothing else around, no matter what is going on, will actually matter. Like right at the beginning when I wanted you to offload your burdens and, and, and maybe look inside that rucksack um, that you, and look at that bit of burden that you're carrying that you, you really didn't want to look at. When we have that honest face-to-face -face conversation, you're not going to worry because he's going to know it's, he knows it's there anyway. It's actually you've got the problem, not him. And, and he'll be honest with you about it. And when you know about it and you're in his presence, it's not going to matter because it just gets eradicated with love. I had the privilege of listening to Pastor David's sermon um, on, 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 on the video and I already had this in mind and I saw he, the, he was talking about the fact that, you know, everything, we should live everything today in light of what's coming in the future. And there was that whole thing about the fact that just, it, that there is no more tears and no more pain and no more else right at the end of all creation. Yeah, and we're really looking forward to that. And, you know, unfortunately, it's not going to come. It was bizarre, actually. That day I was in walking back home, and all I heard was somebody swearing and shouting something about some woman clearly being a female dog. Um, but she didn't use that word. She used the unique B word. Um, and somebody else I heard moaning, and then I heard a massive argument. I thought, this is just from here to where I live in Braun Avenue. There's so much tears and pain and anger. And that's not coming. But the problem is we hang on to tears and pain and anger we don't need to hang on to. And so in God's presence, it can be eradicated by his love. And I think God wants to really talk about the fact what sets you apart is his presence. Amen? And yet, here's the question I'm going to ask, and it's for us to mull on for a minute. Why is it we seem to struggle to want to spend time in his presence? Why do we fill it in with other rubbish? It's because we want to hide our face with a pillow because we're worried about meeting with our Lord face to face. And yet he is our friend. As Jesus said in John chapter 15, I no longer call you my servants. I'm actually, you are my friends. Because a master doesn't tell his servant what he is doing, but you are my friend. So I actually will tell you what's going on. Now, Moses already had that unique relationship pre-Jesus. So how much more do we have it now post-Jesus? Who died to eradicate our sins. So, this is a season of God's presence. Because everything is driven then from being in the presence of the living God. Amen? So it's about actually what a privilege it is to actually be in his presence to take time out, to actually go and set ourselves outside for a while and specifically be in God's presence. And also to be in his presence wherever you're going. Because wherever you are, you really are in his presence anyway. First and foremost, because he's everywhere. And second of all, he lives in you anyway if you're a born-again Christian. <gasps> breathe. On the voice, if they don't breathe right, they get the timing wrong. It's 
In our campsite, um, when we were camping, I sleep the best I ever sleep in a tent. I don't sleep very well in London, but in a tent, on a camp bed, I sleep normally really soundly and really amazingly. Probably because there's no other distractions other than listening to nature. Even when one night it was howling down with rain and the wind was blowing up 40 mile per hour gust winds, our tent did not move. The Air Burghaus Air 6 air tent is amazing. It did not move. But that's probably the closest you get to nature. And there's no distractions. There's nothing else between me other than a bit of flappy material between us and the elements. There was one moment I thought the tree might snap and fall on us. I would have put joy above me to protect me. <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble later. But that's the closest to peace I think I get outside of spending time with the Lord. I sleep so well in the country. And I think you will sleep so much better and spend more time at peace and no more fear when we spend more time recognizing how much God is present with us and we're present in God, rather than filling it up with distractions, filling up our lives. I believe the Lord wants to say, I am your friend. Yes, I am Lord, absolutely. But I'm also your friend. And it's with that confidence and that boldness we can come into his presence. So I want to encourage you for this season, whatever that season lasts for, whatever that is going forward, is to be in God's presence. Actually allow no other distractions to take over. Allow him. It's not because the, the distractions are such a sin, but it's not about sin eradication. It's about being in his presence. <coughs> and allowing everything else to flow from that. Does that make sense? all kept done be in God's presence let's um, take a few moments Frank's going to come up we're going to sing a few songs and about you when I read that Moses story I want to be like Moses And like Moses, I can come up with every excuse under the sun. But our Lord still says, I'm your friend, come. Sometimes we need to realize how much he loves us and we need a real passion for it, yes? So, we're gonna sing, set a fire down in my soul. I want more of you, God. Problem is, we can have everything of God. Problem is, we're the ones who put the restrictions in place, not him. So if you're able to, please will you stand? We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.